Greetings and uh, hello to you. This is part three of our webinar series entitled Earth Observations for Energy Management. And today's webinar will focus on a tool that we've developed uh, to provide uh, community specific data parameters uh, related to energy. And uh, so the title of our webinar is Understanding and Obtaining NASA Data Products through power. So what is NASA power? What is our purpose? Our power stands for the prediction of worldwide renewable energy resources. It's a project funded by the NASA Applied Sciences Program to help facilitate the usage of NASA Earth observations, analysis, and modeling to answer key societal questions. And we are focused on three different areas. So we're focused on trying to improve the nation's public and private capability for integrating environmental data from NASA's Earth observations and research to and, and particularly centered around solar surface solar irradiance. So we're trying to support renewable energy development, building energy efficiency and sustainability, and agriculture applications. So what is our role? Well, we, we support these communities by providing public, publicly free and open access, uh, convenient um, distribution of NASA Earth observations through an integrated services suite. You can see some uh, screenshots of that of the main page here. And we have done that by supporting these societal benefit spe areas specifically by interacting with those communities and uh, customizing the data parameters in the, uh, the units that are typically used by those communities. And so uh, that has been a big role of how we support, support the needs of the users. So we develop also key partnerships with the scientific data providers. So we have a relationship with the data providers, so we understand the data products, and then we have relationships with those using those products, and we customize the parameters, both the parameters and their units and their documentation for the community needs. So what questions can be answered using the observations that we provide through the Power GIS Web Services tool? Well. Here are, some, here are some questions that we'll talk about, and particularly we'll show some examples in webinar four, but just to understand uh, the sorts of data products we're providing, these questions are, are uh, questions that can be answered. For instance, what is the typical variability of the sunlight, the temperature and winds over the past 25 to 30 years in a particular area? What is the anticipated level of production for an installed photovoltaic field? Is there an optical tilt, optimal tilt angle that considers cloud patterns? Is this regional area potentially suitable for wind power generation? And how do we understand the variability of building environment climate parameters uh, needed to determine current and future building standards? Can we uh, determine if incorporating renewable energy technologies into a currently existing building makes sense uh, from both an environmental and economic perspective? Can I monitor the performance of my building and see if retrofitting new renewable energy technologies is feasible? And, and how can I, uh, if, if I introduce a class to the principles and effectiveness of implementing solar technologies or other renewable energy technologies anywhere in the world? So those are some questions. But to answer those questions, we need particular data parameters. And those parameters are available through NASA research programs. So here we, we discuss the sorts of parameters that are needed to derive the energy specific information. For instance, we need to know the sunlight information, how much solar radiance is incident to the surface of the Earth and its components. So the direct, which is seeing the actual disk of the sun, the diffuse, which is the scattered energy scattered out of the 
direction of the sun, the various different solar ge geometric angles, surface albedo, which is the how reflective that surface is, and then meteorological information such as the surface temperature, humidity, and quantities like the minimal maximum surface temperature in a day, or the dew point, or the relative humidity, wind speed and direction are relevant. Cloud coverage, thickness, and type. These are all relevant parameters that we use uh, and, and are derived in the course of NASA research that we're making available through the Power Tool. We, we make those available on the hourly. That'll be our new version coming up. But right now we have daily, monthly, annual, and long-term averages of these quantities. On the right-hand side here is a, an example. This is the long-term average of surface uh, surface downward flux, and uh, we'll define this term in just a second. But it's a long-term average, example of that. And then the bottom panel is example of the variability of that quantity for a specific location. So both of those sorts of information are available via power. So what we've done here, power provides access to these research data sets. And the current version uh, provides access to from, from four different main data sets at a daily uh, resolution. And um, those are uh, here. And we, what we'll do for this webinar is we'll describe these in more detail. But just to identify them, we use a product called the, the GUX Surface Radiation Budget, its current version. Uh, which is being upgraded, um, but uh, it starts in uh, July 1983 and currently ends uh, temporarily in uh, 2007 that we use in power. And then we use a specialized uh, product from the series mission, which we'll discuss, and that provides data out to near real time within six to seven days of real time. Then we use what was called atmospheric reanalysis from NASA's Goddard Global um, Modeling and Assimilation Office. And those two products, one of them is called MERA2, and the other one is called the FPIT. And these provide the, uh, right now, Power is providing the daily and monthly annual multi year of these from these data products. And these all provide the surface measurements. Uh, surface meteorological quantities is what I mean. So we have a new version. We're actually in the middle of transitioning to this new version, and it's available now for public comment and evaluation, and it's still being improved. But this new version takes advantage of updates to this surface radiation budget data set, and also a new product from the series mission which now is going to be used from 2001 to essentially current, uh, and it provides hourly data. So we're actually going to be, from 2001 onward, providing hourly data quantities uh, of the various parameters uh, needed for energy and energy decisions. And uh, we still have the flash flux uh, data products to keep us within uh, several days of real time. And uh, but those will still be available at the daily level. So um, so this SYN one degree will retain a latency of, of about three three months in the neighborhood of three months when that takes over. And then uh, we can still continue the Mera two and the GMAO uh, FPIT. So now let's talk about this from a more fundamental level and so that we can understand the sorts of quantities and their origin and how are they're computed. So first to just to for definition's sake, what is solar radiance? Well solar radiance is the rate at which solar energy falls onto the surface of the of the earth uh, per unit area in this context. So so the units are power per area or watts per meter squared. And here's a little figure here, it's a schematic here of, of a meter. And if you had 66, 60 watt bulbs, um, that would be about the brightness of averaging annual, global annual average of the amount of energy from the sun to the earth. 
However, on a sunny day with sun high in the sky, you might have 20 of those bulbs in this one meter space, just to give you a sense of the variability there. But the long-term average, which we'll talk about from the sun, is 341 watts per meter squared. So this solar radiance is transmitted through the atmosphere and is vital for understanding climate variability and surface heating. And surface heating, of course, relates to water cycle processes. So in terms of science and earth science and, and its interaction with long-term climate and, and uh, the energy and water cycle budgets of our earth system, uh, that solar radiance is a very key component, and that's why NASA research projects and uh, missions are aimed at, at uh, estimating that quantity. And But also, for our purposes here, the surface solar radiance is a very important factor for the sizing of both solar panel and battery backup systems, solar cooking applications, building designs, and a number of other applications, as we'll discuss in these webinars. So how do we go about computing the surface solar radiance? Well, we need a lot of information. And that information, the first information we need is we need to know the amount of energy that's actually coming from the sun, a particular time and location. We need to know, um, then we have, we observe the, uh, the uh, Earth atmosphere from various different satellites. And so there's a reflected a component of that energy that's coming from the sun and reflected. And we need to measure that. Now there's all sorts of different measurements, types, and we'll really just focus on two different types of measurements. The types of measurements that measure a portion of the sunlight, or we call it the visible spectrum of light, or those that measure the entire solar spectrum, and I'll, and I'll describe those for you. But the key relationship here is that the amount of energy, the total amount of energy reflected from the, from the atmosphere, the clouds, the aerosols, and even the surface uh, relates to how much energy is transmitted through the atmosphere to the surface. So, so that, is a, that is a key relationship that many algorithms to estimate the amount of solar that's actually transmitted, the amount depicted here, that's is the quantity that we're looking at trying to estimate here. How much energy is transmitted through the clouds? How much is right th directly through the atmosphere? How much comes is through uh, aerosols to the surface? And of course, we do this at the uh, up to now the currently daily, but now in the future uh, hourly time scales. So we need also information about the atmospheric gases that absorb and scatter light. We need information about the types and thicknesses of the clouds. Uh, we need information about the aerosols and their extent and their properties whether and how much they absorb versus, versus scatter light. And then we need information about the reflective nature of the surface, which we call albedo. So, so this gives you a sense of, of how these sorts of measurements, uh, estimates are made. It's not a direct measurement, the solar radiance at the surface. The direct measurement is the reflection. And so the reflection comes from these various different parts of the system. So whether it's from the reflected from the atmosphere or aerosols or, um, or the clouds, um, that is the light that's measured. So we're trying to infer what's transmitted by studying what's reflected. So we start with measuring the sun. And so here on the left-hand side is a UV picture of the sun. And the only emphasis here is to understand the sun is active. And so this, this nice video shows some solar prominences and other features of the sun's surface. And that means that there's some variability in the amount of energy from the sun that reaches the Earth. And so we want to capture that. And we have specific instruments that we support and uh, work with uh, and bring in and eventually distribute through power that provide that information. And this is current mission is called the TSIS, Total Solar Irradiance uh, uh, Mission, uh, Total and Spectral Solar Irradiance Sensor here. 
uh, and it's on board the International Space Station. And uh, and it it this mission followed an earlier satellite mission called Source, which was recently ended in 2020. So if you put those measurements together, you can see over over the last few decades the uh, variability of the sun. Now this is relatively small by the time you calculate all the angles and factor in day and night and average over the whole globe. But still, this is the amount of energy that's received at the top of the atmosphere, 1,361 of those uh, watts per meter squared, at the unit that we talked about. And you can see it's variability in time. And so that's one thing that we try to capture and is a key input to our data products. So the next thing is how do we get those cloud properties? And so the way we do that is we collaborate with another project um, for the earliest part of our data products. Uh, we, we work with the International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project, or ISCIP, and this is now a data product that's, that's uh, developed by NOAA, and it's, we have worked a long time with the, this group. They used to be located at NASA uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies in New York City, and they've now taken NOAA, they've delivered their algorithms to NOAA to run. So this was part of our GUX, uh, GUX uh, efforts. GUX stands for the Global Energy and Water Exchange Program. And under that program, uh, we collaborated with a number of groups doing global data sets. And one in our particular role was to derive the surface radiation budget. So surface radiation includes the solar amount of solar energy uh, solar radiance hitting the Earth. So what ISKIP does is it puts together every three hours all the world's geosynchronous satellites, and this is a, what we call affectionately the ISKIP quilt. And so starting in 1980, and this is longitude, so this covers from minus 180 to 180, the whole globe, you can see all the world's geosynchronous satellites on one plot here in their relative positions and as they come and go throughout the time periods. And um, you can even see that there were gaps in certain time periods until about 1998. And, and you can see that this is a very uneven distribution, uh, but we've cross calibrated all these instruments. Uh, these are usually, uh, I mentioned instruments that just measure a portion of the, of the visible spectrum. That's what these instruments do. And then NOAA has flown polar orbiters they're called sun synchronous, meaning they, they cross the equator at a, at a given time. So, so those, and usually it's a morning or afternoon uh, orbit. And, and so those are combined with all the geosynchronous to provide a global three hourly picture of the clouds. And we process that uh, as a key input to deriving our surface uh, solar radiance. I think I measured, uh, mentioned already that we begin in uh, July 19, actually I should say 1983, um, for this data set and power features from January 1984. So what is our GUX SRB algorithm? Um, so it, it's an it's a iterative algorithm, meaning that we, we try to compute and match the um, match the reflectance of the clouds to what's uh, reflected at the satellite and, and thus transmitted through to the atmosphere. So it, it comes in parts. We look at the clear sky parts and from those we derive a surface albedo with an assumption of the aerosols and then we can compute the clear sky solar irradiance. Uh, we use, of course, information about the atmosphere, uh, so the various different gaseous distributions, the total solar irradiance, as I already talked about, from the sun, and then information about aerosols that we get from other sources and other projects. We also look at the surface type and whether or not there's snow coverage. And so all those are fed in with the surface albedo, and we have an iterative process here to determine the cloud reflectance and transmission properties that um, 
that are consistent and reflect the amount of energy that's measured by the various different sensors. So from that, once we determine the cloud reflectance and transmittance, we can compute how much energy then is actually incident uh, on the surface. So we have a cloudy sky irradiance and a clear sky. Those are combined with cloud fraction and to get what we call all sky, which means it's it's the average of both the clear and the cloudy sky solar uh, surface solar irradiance. So this is every three hours and it's at the 100 kilometer uh, scale. Now, we've mentioned, we talked about the series project. Series is a different instrument altogether. And it is part of the series mission. And series stands for the Clouds and Earth's Radiant Energy System. And uh, this started flying, and uh, the version that we're currently using started flying on this Terra satellite starting in uh, 2000. And this is a picture here of the instrument itself. Unlike the, uh, the imagers, we call them, that measure just portions of the spectrum, whether it's uh, solar or even thermal infrared spectrum, this instrument actually measures the entire solar spectrum and also the, uh, what we call the thermal infrared spectrum. So energy from the sun comes in to the Earth atmosphere system, Thermal infrared energy is emitted by the Earth atmosphere system back to space. So the balance of those two gives us a sense of the balance of energy of our Earth, uh, Earth, Earth energy system called our radiation budget. And so this instrument is um, on board uh, polar orbiters. And this depiction shows you uh, down here on the bottom. Uh, shows you the um, there it goes. It shows you how it samples the Earth flying over the pole and then flying every 90 minutes. It does a complete orbit, and um, it has much higher accuracy and stability uh, than those other instruments uh, that we've discussed. Part of the Escape data product, and also besides the series instrument. The uh, Terra has the uh, MODIS instrument, and this MODIS instrument is uh, like the uh, is measures portions of the spectrum. It has various different channels, and uh, so it can help us determine the cloud and aerosol radiated uh, radio properties. So, so what Ceres does is it combines both this what we call the broadband measurements with cloud and aerosol and atmospheric properties that are measured by the imagers. Right now, Ceres is on four different satellites. Power data right now is focused on providing data products from Terra and Aqua. And in the future, we'll probably be seeing products coming from NOAA 20. And uh, so, so, so these data sets, uh, are an upgrade because of their stability, and the MODIS uh, imagers are much more have many more spectral channels and um, much better quality than the uh, than the uh, than the other uh, NOAA orbiters that we talked about. So, so in our new version, we're featuring a data set called the Series SYN One Degree, which stands for Synoptic One Degree, and it's produced using those cloud retrievals I mentioned from the MODIS. And, um, and also, it uses geosynchronous satellite-derived cloud properties to fill in uh, between times of the overpasses to estimate radiative fluxes every hour. And so that is what we're going to be upgrading to. The uh, data set, SYN one degree, actually starts in March 2000. Hour will feature it from of uh, January 2001. And um, so SYO1 degree incorporates the, the Terra Aqua using series instruments with fused MODIS and the GeoCloud properties that are cross-calibrated cross to MODIS, MODIS to supplement between those orbits, as I mentioned. And we still have the key inputs, the total solar radiance we mentioned, the ice and snow maps, surface types, and the atmospheric reanalysis, which we'll be describing in a little bit. 
plus aerosol properties and estimates of surface albedo. So these these pictures here give you a sense of what it, what a series measurement might look like uh, in, in terms of a global distribution for the reflected solar. So you can see uh, the cloud patterns and also the thermal infrared. Clouds are usually cold, so uh, it's particularly high clouds. So those are seen by the, the smaller fluxes here. This is a long-term average then of the surface solar irradiance with the blues being where it's darker, of course, in, in the poles, and this brighter is in the tropics. And the variation is, is caused by long-term cloud patterns. We have one other product that power features, and that's called the flash flux uh, products. And flash flux is, is essentially, essentially a simplified version of that SYN one degree product. We use a um, atmospheric reanalysis product, so the so the temperature and water vapor profiles from the atmosphere provided within a, a two day period, and uh, the first uh, first delivery of MODIS and series. And then we go ahead and we compute our daily average fluxes, but we do it within five to six days, whereas SYN one degree now takes about three to four months to be delivered. So with flash flux, we can, we can uh, reduce the latency and provide products for uh, much lower latencies and our target is currently six to seven days. Um, and uh, we, we continually assess the data quality for those products. We, uh, and, and we've shown, demonstrated that the day-to-day -day variability uh, is sufficiently consistent to enable a lot of problems, a lot of, a lot of analysis where uh, the variability of the uh, solar, daily solar radiance is very important. Okay, and for the beta, we'll maintain the flash flux data products. Um, they use a different algorithms than SYN one degree, I should mention, and uh, but they still maintain a reasonable quality that's useful for applications. So I've mentioned data quality. So how do we determine data quality? Well, we we work with another um, uh, group, several groups actually, that produce surface radiation, surface solar radiance measurements. And, and particularly, we work with the Baseline Surface Radiation Network. This network, you can see here over here, it has a distributed group of surface sites uh, that have the best calibration uh, procedures. Uh, they are required to calibrate to the, the World Radiation Center in Davos, Switzerland, every couple of years and must provide calibration uh, uh, information relative to their standards. So, so they provide uh, estimates of the uh, of all the solar components that we need to validate. So we will compare, and this is an example of the comparisons of the uh, those measurements to the, our various sources of data products. So from the GUX SRB to the at series SYN one degree is depicted here to the flash flux. We assess our data quality both uh, in the ensemble for all time periods, that's what's depicted here, but also uh, as a function of time to make sure the data products and, and provide the users with, with the um, information on the data quality. I note that um, we provide uh, information in, in our methodology documentation that's available on our website. Here is the link uh, that you can go to and uh, uh, read about the data quality. So in summary, this is the solar products that we feature right now in power. We have the SRB, the older version, and that's spanning through 2007, and then a flash flux taking over from there. And uh, this is all, of course, the daily data at this time. Now, the new version will feature the new SRB, but it will end at through the year 2000, where we'll pick up with the series SYN one degree product and feature that at the hourly resolution, and then and then the uh, 
the uh, flash flux. So, but the nice thing here is that we will be, uh, we have an 18 or we have a 19 year record of, from series and building to 20. Uh, so they'll have 20 years of hourly data products from this, from this series SYN one degree product. This is just a depiction of what's captured when you look at the hourly data. And uh, it's uh, going by pretty quickly here, but you can see that, that the clouds moderate the amount of energy transmitted to the surface. And every day, uh, the solar uh, cycle is, is estimated. So what about this surface meteorological parameters? Uh, how do we get those? We get those by collaborating with NASA's Global Modeling and Assimilation Office the GMAO, and they produce data products from atmospheric assimilations. Uh, and uh, so what is that? So this, this figure up here kind of dictate, uh, schematically illustrates what a data assimilation process is. The first thing is, is they, they have an atmospheric model. It's a global model. And um, they run this model in a, in a forecasted mode. But what, but the key to this process is the observations. They, they assimilate a large number of observations and they interpret the, interpolate the model to those observations to, to uh, moderate a, 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 a total global field and then use that field to rerun the model. So in other words, and they do that uh, to to re, to essentially make the model uh, agree with the observations and optimize the model solutions. And so uh, it runs iteratively. There's a model six hour forecasts are adjusted within thresholds to the observations and those model forecasts are rerun to produce the various products that we use. So we use two different products. One is called the FPIT and uh, this this product the forward processing instrument team. This product is is uh, uses a lesser set of the observations because it's striving to to produce products at two days, uh, and um, and it also uh, has some other uh, simplified features to get to that latency. However, the long term is provided from a product called MARA2, which is MARA stands for the Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications. MARA2 has a simulator of 50 billion observations over the last 40 years. Let me give you a sense of what's that like. So this depiction here is the sorts of observations that are simulated. The, they assimilate observations from the surface, so those could be surface weather stations or, or buoys, or they could come in from uh, ships. You can see here uh, aircraft tracks, they assimilate those. Um, they assimilate a large variety of satellite information, so you can see here these are satellite overpass uh, as, as the satellites move, and, the, and they and there's a number of different sorts of sensors that they that they assimilate. So it's not only the visible ones that we've talked about are thermal infrared, but also uh, microwave uh, instrumentation and atmospheric sounders, which is <clears throat> usually an IR technique to estimate the uh, water vapor profiles, water vapor and temperature profiles of the atmosphere. Also, even GPS uh, occupation measurements. All these measurements are uh, assimilated and used to, to optimize the model solutions. Uh, I provide here the website so you can go and look at some other simul um, simulations that they have here. But um, it is a very complicated uh, system and uh, over 50 billion observations have been simulated from MARA2. Well, we also take a look at the MARA2 data quality too, and that's part of our documentation on the website. And we typically compare both our daily products uh, using surface um, weather station data from all around the world as collected by NOAA, 
and uh, their Center for Environmental Information. They have two products. One is for the daily, it's called the Global Summary of the Day. And the other one is actually has the hourly data uh, from all those measurements. And so we, uh, we compare our measured, our the, the MERA2 parameters to the actual surface measurements for various different quantities and even the derived quantities that uh, we make later on so that, um, so that uh, we give the user a sense of how good those data products are. And so that information is contained in our methodology. To give an example, the two meter temperature usually has an RMS somewhere around one degree Celsius. And that is, that is uh, very plenty good for uh, most of the applications that, uh, that we uh, support through uh, power. Uh, we typically produce some statistics and I've, I've now uh, analyzed on four-year uh, blocks so that we can get a sense for how that data quality might change as a function of time as well. So in summary, uh, this is the current production system. And, uh, and you can see here the MERA2 that is uh, pended with FPIT. MERA2 and FPIT have run a very similar model just there's just a lesser observations and the MERA2 does feature a um, bias correction for precipitation that FPIT does not but otherwise they're very similar and they span the, the what power is available and the new the new um, the new version which is on beta right now will continue to do this but MERA2 and it does provide hourly data so we will we will bring that hourly data and make that now available through power um, with the hourly solar products from Ceres. And uh, that will start in the 2001 time period. Okay, so that gave you a little bit about the observations that uh, and analysis of modeling products that are used as a base set line set of products. Uh, for the power tool. Now we'd like to give you an overview of the structure of the power tool, get, get you a bit of orientation. And um, so I'll introduce for that uh, Bradley McPherson, who is the lead developer of the Power Wedge Services tool. So Bradley. Thank you very much. Now we're gonna go over how Power provides its web services portal so that everyone can access the long-term meteorology and solar data as analysis-ready data for users. You can navigate to the Power website at power.lark.nasa.gov to explore these things that we're going to explain throughout this presentation. So, Power data is provided in three core ways. We have an application programming interface that provides single point data for analysis ready data, provides long time series, it provides the, as we previously discussed, the hourly, the daily, the monthly, and the climatology data directly through a custom URL, which we'll describe a little bit later, that allows you to efficiently access and use the data either as a direct in, implement integration into your existing application, or you can download it statically and then do stuff on a local computer. We also provide the Power Data Access Viewer, which has web maps and integrated widgets that helps you interact with that API in a very user-friendly and intuitive way. It helps you select the parameters, the units, the time periods, and allows you to pick your outputs for direct download so you can use those in, again, in your own applications, or you can help learn how to develop from the API. We also provide ArcGIS image services and feature services that support geospatially enabled data. Typically, we're using those now for climatology purposes, but they allow for that direct integration to your geographic information systems. So you can do analysis without ever having to download the data. You can make web-based maps. You can click through different time scales, and you can just use the data remotely. So what does Power Application Programming Interface do? Power APIs deliver that analysis-ready data 
as direct input to the decision support tools, modeling, forecasting packages to scientific research. So we provide complete access to our data archive. It supports that direct integration. So you submit a request and within seconds, the data is returned to you for use. Typically, when you're trying to get long time series data, you have to assimilate yourself a lot of different sources of data. Well, we've done that work for you. So when you request a time series of data, the response back from our systems is going to be that time series of data for you to use immediately. So we provide formats like ASCII, ICASA, CSV, GeoJSON, NetCDF, and more. We take feedback from the community, so we get a lot of requests for a format. We've added it, just like one that's not shown here. We've recently, in the beta, added the EPW format. So again, what is the Power API? So here's just some examples of how the URLs look. So when we send this PowerPoint out, you can go ahead and click on any of these links here, and you'll be able to test out the, the new beta API endpoints and just download some data directly. So the API is structured as a URL that defines like the path, and then the URI, we give the components where your start, end time, your location, the community, which corresponds to the units that you want to have, as well as what parameters you want. And we have tools that can help you build these, but I'll go through the DAV in a second, which helps you get a good jump on building these things because it's through an innovative, integrated graphic user interface. Now here's an example of the JSON response on the right, and this is one of many formats that we provide. So as I was mentioning before, the Power Data Access Viewer provides a front-end web map with simple widgets that allows users to click through and basically explore the data graphically using the web map. So it talks to the Power API on the back end. So this application itself doesn't actually do any of the data processing. It just builds that URI that we described in the previous slide and then sends you back that response for you to click and download. It enables you to just answer these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions and you'll be able to provide or obtain that information that you need. It also does provide some image services, which we'll show you on a later slide so you can visually see and describe. And also, it does also show some graphing capabilities as well. So this video here is just shows you how to, to use the data access viewer. So you click access data, you click the data access viewer. Once it loads, you can read the little splash page and click access data. And then you go through and just answer these questions. So I wanted to leave the renewable unit, re, renewable energy community. I wanted hourly data. I wanted Cincinnati as my location. I want to start in 2004 and I go to a different end period for the time range of my hourly data request. I wanted to select a different file format than the default. And I wanted to explore some of the different parameters so I can go through the different folders and check them and close them. And then I wanted to add temperature as well. Once you hit submit relatively quickly, your data is already downloaded to your computer. You click that cached link there and it downloads it right to your computer. And then I'm just going to open it up and show you as a CSV. And it's just a prepared long time series of data that is hourly. But you could have done the different endpoints as well. So you could have done daily, monthly, uh, custom climatology as well. So as I mentioned, we do have the web maps for visual, visual representation of the data. And there's some of the, um, the graph there shows the integrated um, time series data. It only renders at the daily level, but we're working on some developments to support hourly graphing capabilities. Just hourly data is a, a lot of data to, to graph very quickly. So for the image services themselves, you can click on them to get a response with the, the value for that typical or for that for that parameter that you're using. You can change the opacity so you can see the underlying topography. You can also skip through the different months and go all the way to the annual average for the climatology itself. So what do you, do you ask services power provide? 
In addition to the, the image services that were previously shown, Power provides a series of feature and additional image services that allow for mapping in like collaborative spaces online. We provide thermal moisture zones, we provide four year rolling thermal moisture zones, we provide difference maps for change detection in thermal or in thermal and thermal moisture zones for for whatever periods. We post all these information to multiple different portals so you can access them into your GIS applications. So everything that we provide is global in nature, so it will have the area you're looking for. So, so here's some more examples specifically about other services that Power provides. We provide story maps. So we have an example of a story map that's not shown here, but it is shown in the next webinar, webinar four, that it shows the like the the bias and validation of the data in a global perspective, and it walks you through how we do some of our analysis step by step. And we're working on developing more tools to help people understand what data bias is and how not necessarily the word bias is bad, because bias could indicate either an under or over prediction for a relative area, but it shows how our data corresponds to the surface site as accurately as possible over time. We also provide, as I mentioned, those difference plots for the thermal moisture zones, so you can see different so like different areas that are getting warmer, and there's a few areas that have gotten colder in the climatology period of this reference. So new to the beta, and this is only available in the beta, is we provide analytic services and reports. So just like the widget that we walked through in the video to get the time series data for hourly, the same series of questions you ask, and you can generate these different reports. So we have the anomaly report now that represents the climate anomalies through the period of time. It produces a numerous number of plots and graphs so you can see the changes over time for your particular point location that you selected. We also have been working with the ASHRAE group to develop the building climate designs conditions report that they provide in their, in their I think, every four years they put out their report, but their report only focuses on areas that have the surface sites where we can generate the report for, report for any location, including islands in the, in the Pacific. So just, we have the, the global capabilities to generate that report. And then we also can provide that a Windrose report using NRL's wind energy thresholds to give you that quick regional synopsis to do that first cut analysis if the wind farm would be suitable for X location. We also, not listed here, do provide custom climatologies through a different widget, which is a little bit of an analytic tool in itself. So here's an example of the reports that I just discussed. On the left is the building climate design conditions report that we work with ASHRAE to develop. Here is just a subset of the numerous reports in the middle for the climate vulnerability and anomalies report. And then on the right is a Windrow support using those NRL classes. We're working on developing some graphics to go along with this, but currently it's just a text-based report now, but it does still provide you that text-based, I mean, that first cut analysis for site validation. Okay. The so next is, where is all this documentation? Dr. Stackhouse mentioned before that we have documentation. He had some links previously. So we provide a lot of documentation now. So of course we provide documentation on our homepage. We are introducing in the beta some new dashboards that will give you that time series look of what data is available since we have a lot of different sources that overlap. So we're gonna have a dashboard that provides that time series information so you can see to exactly what models are where to have that traceability to the source data. We have the docs pages that we had links to in the slides that have all the specifics and detailed information about our methodology, our validation procedures, galleries of different maps and products, help documents, tutorials, and then the API pages themselves that help you build and interact with the APIs themselves. 
So now I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Stackhouse to go over some lesson learns and to give you what's going to come in webinar four. Thank you, Bradley. So what have we learned? Uh, we learned about how the power tool provides NASA Earth observations uh, and, and its structure and the data sets that we provide to users to answer energy related data needs and questions. So we talked about how the global solar irradiance uh, is estimated uh, from satellite observations starting with information about the sun and about the clouds and atmosphere and surface. Uh, whether we use imagers or the series uh, instrument with detailed, more detailed radio transfer calculations, and uh, or and also that uh, we are able to provide estimates within a week of observation. Then we we noted and talked about where the surface meteorological parameters are are obtained from and uh, what the atmospheric reanalysis assimilation uh, is from NASA's MERA-2 and FPIT products. Then we also talked about our NASA Web Services portal and um, the uh, uses from Na of NASA's Earth observations and modeling uh, and the customized data sets and reports that are available spanning all the way from 1984 to near current time. Our, we also learned we had two different versions. So we have a version that just has the day, starts with the daily, monthly, annual, and climatological averages. Uh, and then we've made those available through our API service, <clears throat> our DAV, our Data Access Viewer and also um, noted some web image and feature services that we're still developing and noted that our new version will feature hourly data starting in January, uh, starting for the data date of January 2001 and onward. And uh, we encourage you to uh, tune in for webinar number four, where we go over specific examples of how users have obtained uh, different uh, parameters at different time uh, uh, resolutions, whether long-term climatological data products or time series data products, and how they've used those to answer the questions that we referred to at the beginning of this webinar. The questions relating to uh, renewable energy systems and building systems. And uh, we hope that you'll Tune in for the next uh, webinar, and thank you again for your time. So with that, we conclude this webinar three, and thank you so much for your time. And we're now entered a question and answer period. Thank you, Dr. Stackhouse. So. Hope everyone enjoyed learning about the, the power of data and how we provide it to users. So we're gonna go through the question now. Feel free to continue sending in new questions and we'll get to those at the bottom of this list. So let me start from the beginning. When it comes to wind energy, where wind data of a certain hub height is necessary under different landscapes, how do we extrapolate or estimate wind parameters from the earth related to related data above say 200 meters above the surface so the answer to that is the power product provides meritu data as source and we have that provided at 50 and 10 and 2 meters above the surface but we also have a parameterization implemented which we have the reference on the sheet here that we sent out later that people can implement themselves or use inside the API to provide the to, to provide back the specific height of the data they want. It's based off a, a roughness exponent, which we have the ability to take any, but we have, a I think, about 15 different ones that are implemented in our API. But using this documentation and the code that we included in this strip, people can 
compute it themselves or use our tool. Okay, so the next question is, so the radiance is energy per second per surface then, watts being a joule per second, right? Watts is joules per second, so radiance is the power per surface area. Okay. The next question is, is it feasible to have re-nuclear renewable energy as a combination that acts as a safety firewall around the nuclear? The re may be a solar array. This, this question is kind of beyond the power, but our data products can be used to assess solar radiance in large enough particular areas as a supplemental source. However, we would need a little bit more information to, to answer this. Next question. Wind park sites can cross routes of migrant birds which are seasonal. Routes could have minor variations over time. Can these two aspects be studied from Earth observations in an attempt of correct sighting of wind turbines? Potentially, the power wind product can provide it at a relatively coarse spatial resolution because our data is half by, a, by 6.25 degrees. So it's an excellent tool to use for like the first cut site analysis. But we recommend using the surface site data for when you go further along your analysis process. But we also do provide different variability information and seasonal products and yearly and monthly averages at different temporal levels. So we do have a really good climatology to help you hone in on your area of interest. Next question, number five. Is the International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project Network only in the USA or global? It is a global data set. All the data products that Power uses are in input provided at the global, including the oceans. So Power provides data across the whole globe. So you can access the data, as we mentioned, through that video that I showed a little bit earlier to the Power Data Access Viewer. So you can navigate that to download the data or use any of the other tools that we went through. And then just a little quick note, the ISIP data products are freely available and they're accessible through NOAA's website listed there. Question six, can a user upload their own data set to use the functionalities and capabilities of the Power API on their project? So no, we currently don't have an upload tool that's a supports any of our analysis functions, but we do provide documentation, equations, parameterizations, and our methodology online so people can implement, evaluate, assess, recommend enhancements to our system. We like getting feedback because we like to be involved in the community and be able to update our websites to support what we need to do to, to help you all do your jobs. That's the main goal. We want to provide you all data to help you. Next question. Do greenhouse gases in the atmosphere impact the climate parameters recorded by the satellite sensors? Yes, because the greenhouse gases absorb and emit thermal infrared energy. This will affect how much energy in the wavelengths are observed by the satellites. There are also some CO2 absorption solar radiance, since it's the most important gas in respect to the water vapor itself. Water vapor does absorb solar radiance at the longer wavelengths beyond the visible wavelengths, thus reduces the broadband solar radiance in various satellite channels that are sensitive to those wavelengths. Question eight, how will these data, oh, sorry, there's, I can't see, there's too many things popped up. Will these data always be free of charging? Yes, the plan is to always have the, the NASA data products to be free of charge for the foreseeable future. So we provide all this free of charge. So the more you use it, the hopefully the more data we can provide and we can keep adding enhancements over time. Question number nine. We have been hearing about the sun and earth energy 
evaluations mostly to be used on solar panels and wind energies. Is there anyone working on thermal difference energy within water mass, oceans, and lakes, and how to harness it? We do not currently have any data projects related to tidal energy or the stored energy within the ocean. It would require information about the currents and things, but there are NASA products that we can look up and add in here because I'm sure the last two two presentations or trainings were able to add some other sources that we can add in here to help answer this this question. Okay, the last question here is with regard to power data, could you elaborate further possible on the application of the GIS data set? So yes, so this isn't written here, but I can speak to this one. So currently power provides some image services and feature services that allow you directly connect to the data. Currently, we only provide climatology-based image services that have the data in the back end that you can bring into either QGIS, ArcGIS, or other GIS software. We provide currently more feature services, but we're working in collaboration with Mera2 and different groups to help and, and SR not in SRB and series to be able to provide those image services. So our, our long-term goal is to have image services that are integrated with long time series. So you can like basically play a video in our data access viewer and do on the fly analysis. But currently we only have the climatologies, but we are working to hopefully get that monthly and that monthly and annual data up first. And then after that, we'd want to work on daily data. I know that Mera 2 is about to start doing some, some testing to provide the daily based Mera 2 image service that we are, we're already talk, in talk with them to test and integrate, and some other future data products that we're implementing on the beta and the future already are out there to the public. So we're actively working on that, and that's one of the things we're enhancing. Okay. Evan, Please continue sending your questions. We still have some more time. We can continue answering them. But does Dr. Sackhouse, do you want to add anything to this? Well, hello. Yes, uh, thank you, Bradley. I'm sorry. I had some background noise, which is now cleared up. So I uh, appreciate you going through all this. Um, just one more addition on question number seven, do greenhouse gases in the atmosphere impact the climate parameters recorded uh, by satellite sensors? I think. I think I answered that, but we're typically are providing information on the brand brand solar. I should I should mention though that we do have information on the thermal infrared fluxes, which are actually used for building energy efficiency, because uh, that relates to the cooling of those structures, uh, particularly at night. Um, and so those are more sensitive to the to the uh, greenhouse gas contributions. Um, but I, I didn't know if the question was aimed at at the satellite sensors or just the themselves so so those sensors are just sensitive to the amount of energy depending on the type of sensor it is whether it's reflected sunlight or, or uh, for the broadband or the broadband thermal infrared or if it's particular wavelength uh, channels and so those channels have different sensitivities depending on, on the various uh, different gaseous properties. But water vapor is the most important uh, gas here because CO2 provides a, a small radiative effect, but it gets enhanced because of the, uh, the uh, processes uh, related to water vapor. Um, a small change in temperature uh, allows more water vapor to be held in the air, and thus uh, the water vapor uh, has a much larger effect on uh, the absorption of light. So, so hopefully that gives you some insight into that. So, the uh, but the right now the particular signature of CO2 is very small, and and uh, it uh, we don't have long-term measurements of uh, CO2, which is basically uh, models or surface measurements of CO2, but not from satellite. So, uh, in particular, so I wasn't sure whether you were asking a question on that, but. All the parameters that we compute take into account the change in the variability of the CO2 and the water vapor in time. So the MERA2 does that as well, as well as our uh, estimates of solar radiance uh, at the surface and our thermal infrared radiate fluxes. 
Okay. And uh, Bradley did a great job on the uh, GIS question. It looks like there is another, uh, what are the parameters? So question number 11, I guess, what are the parameters through which we measure solar radiance data quantity? Can you elaborate? Um, quality, quality, okay, I see now. Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're looking, we compare our estimates of the solar radiance at the surface to surface measurements. And we tried to show you one figure, but we didn't give you the details on that. Uh, our methodology documentation does provide uh, a, a more thorough description but there's global sets of surface uh, measurements that are highly calibrated that we use. It's from a network called the Baseline Surface Radiation Network. And we also compared other well-calibrated surface sites, but those BSRN surface sites and those other sites that, uh, that are conform to BSRN standards and calibration are those that we use to compare our estimates of solar radiance to and uh, thus determine uh, the relative uh, biases and variability in terms of say RMS or uh, standard deviation, correlation, and other statistical uh, measures of agreement. So um, we'll, uh, we'll write that answer out for you there. Uh, question number 12, are there any attempts to make this available via Google Earth uh, engine or plugins on QGIS? Um, I don't know, Bradley, I don't think we do. Oh, it looks like we have an answer. We are open to any system. Um, you yeah, know, we haven't, we haven't yet made things available in the Google Earth for engine format. Um, the, uh, the QGIS should be able to read our, uh, image services. I don't know, Bradley, if you want to. Uh, yeah. So uh, currently our time series data is accessible via our API and QGIS without a plugin since we provide our, our standard JSON format is actually a, a GeoJSON format. So you're able to directly ingest the, the single point data with the long time series like metadata or actually data information attached to it. But we currently don't have any plans for the Google Earth Engine, but we are aware of other projects at NASA that are using it. So something we're definitely should look into in the future but we are actually working with aws as part of a space act agreement to hopefully host all of the power data archive on aws and make it more easily accessible to users so sort of using it's another cloud-based system so it's not specifically google earth engine but aws is another major one so we're moving in that direction with our data products all right, thanks, Bradley. And um, there's question number 13. Is question number 13 aimed at uh, it? Well, it reads, what are the possible reasons of the deviation between recorded data and the estimate data? Um, that depends on what measurements uh, you're, you're referring to. Uh, if you're referring to the measurements that I described a bit earlier, the solar irradiance measurements at the surface, what are some of the difference? Well, the key difference to bear in mind is that that is a point measurement, and these data are representative of an area, a gridded area. So our solar irradiance products right now are representative of 100 by 100 kilometer area. So the cloud fields are resolved in that. So what you'll find is for the long term, there, if their biases appear, that will be due to some sort of issue related to, say, the uh, ambient inaccuracies in ambient aerosols, because the cloud fields statistically move through those those areas, and so the longer time frames, once you get out to the monthly time frames, but even a couple of weeks, you tend to get a compensation between the the point measurement and the uh, temporal averaging. Uh, so that compensation helps to alleviate uh, biases. So what you see at this using a course data for a point is at very short time measurements, you get a lot of noise. Uh, and so that will be because of the various different cloud configurations and uh, reflection off those clouds through gaps in the clouds and so on and so forth. So 
So we can get deviations from that. But typically those that noise will settle down and and so then the bias will result if there's some sort of systematic error in uh, the aerosol optical properties or uh, the gaseous properties, for instance, of water vapor uh, bias in that region. Um, so, so the inputs can be relatively biased. Um, also, if if there's um, some error in the way we represent the, the cloud uh, on the whole, and that cloud tends to occur um, tends to occur frequently in that area. In terms of temperature and uh, other measurements, we have the same sort of issue in the sense of it's a point measurement. Uh, versus a gridded average. The meteorological properties are actually representative of an area that's about a half degree. Uh, and so that's a much, it's a smaller area. Um, but we still have issues of variability within the grid cell itself. And, um, and so that will tend to lead to variability. So for instance, if you have uh, a site that's near a lake, or uh, up, up on a mountain that's within a grid box, even though the grid box represents the entire area of all the surface types within that area, uh, there could be small biases in temperature and water vapor, or like dew point and things uh, due to that. In terms of the solar, back to the solar, if there are processes within that 100 kilometer grid cell that are very localized, uh, where the clouds don't flow through. In other words, you have standing clouds like on a coastal region or in a mountainous region, then we can see some biases uh, due to that because the clouds don't statistically move through the areas. All right, um, and we'll try to write out a, uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, trying to write that out and we'll try to review that and try to give a clear answer on that. It's a good question. How do you effectively filter through cloud data when scanning for smoke and fire zones? Uh, well, uh, that that it, smoke is going to be an issue because there will be times where smoke is identified, particularly thick smoke. We have uh, algorithms that try to determine whether or not a particular uh, cloud pixel, a pixel, a satellite uh, return, uh, reflected light from from, from what we call a pixel, an area, a small area, actually has clouds uh, or not. And so if there is heavy smoke in the area and we don't have the information to treat the, the uh, heavy smoke from, a, from an active fire, say, uh, then, uh, then we might identify a uh, thick smoke as cloud. And this happens very frequently. So there are inaccuracies in and around areas of active and thick uh, fire regions uh, because of that process where we don't, we don't have the smoke plumes properly captured and they might be identified as cloud. Now we actually do estimate, once we think it's a cloud, we'll estimate the amount of solar sunlight through that cloud, through that, what we think is a cloud, but it's an aerosol smoke. And of course, smoke is more absorbing. So we'll, We'll reduce our solar uh, irradiance estimate, uh, but it won't be as reduced as much as um, it would have if we understood it to be smoke that's very absorbing of sunlight. Is there any data, question number 15, is there any data related on the interaction of radiation impacting atmosphere, space, or outside of the Earth? Well. I'm not sure we're, if, what you're thinking, but we only consider the wavelengths from the sun. Of course, the sun is, of course, outside the Earth. So we're only considering the visible through the thermal infrared wavelengths. And so um, for the thermal infrared wavelengths, we typically assume that the amount of energy from space to the top of the atmosphere is zero. And I think that's that's pretty accurate, I think. Um, uh, you know, regarding the sort of amounts of energy uh, related to the temperature of deep space versus, uh, you know, what we have on the Earth, uh, assuming making that assumption is a good assumption. Um, 
so I think if that's what you're referring to, then I, I don't think for our purposes that that is a major contributor, uh, except obviously from the sun. Uh, so we do consider the, uh, the energy from, from the sun, obviously. Okay. Is uh, GeoJSON format a unique format or is it somewhat similar to, you know, Bradley, that might be a question. Well, let's see, he's written out there. So GeoJSON is unique data format. We follow the GeoJSON standard. Uh, so I don't know, Bradley, if you want to add to that answer for question yeah. number 16. Yep. So it, it's a unique data format that's been around for at least 15 years. So it's... So it's basically just a JSON format, and then it has a little bit of metadata in it that allows the like a geospatial application, so like a GIS system, to be able to read it and assign it the geographic location. So our we we follow that standard. So it, I don't really know how to elaborate more. <laughs> yep, it, it, it can recognize it. We're, we're working on adding, I think we might have one tutorial showing it on our new docs for the beta, but we're going to, in the future, start adding more tutorials to help people like use the, the API inside of geospatial applications more efficiently. Bradley, question number 17, I guess, as a follow-up, it is does the ArcGIS recognize the GeoJSON? It should. I know our tutorial focuses on QGIS, though, but it should. Well, you've read in our GeoJSON and in, in yeah, our yeah. GIS before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. the questions, the answer is yes to that, right? Sorry, yes. I'll change it. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll add the links to the tutorials on here as well. Okay, I'm, I'm not hearing any additional questions at the moment, but I presume that this uh, will be open uh, for a little bit longer. And then of course, uh, there are, uh, you can uh, email additional questions that you think of later. You can always email the RSET team or us. And so um, uh, we do thank you for the time that uh, you spent uh, reviewing our power tool today. And I do hope that uh, it is becomes something that's uh, useful for you. Uh, and. Uh, and thank you uh, for your questions and interest. And uh, and I guess we'll uh, close uh, this morning's session. And, uh, uh, I should have mentioned that uh, our webinar four does contain some more specific usage cases. And uh, we hope that you can make some time and join us for webinar four next week, next Tuesday. And uh, this will be made available online. Today's uh, presentation will be made available online and the questions as well so that uh, if uh, you can review those and, uh, and work with those. So again, we thank you for your time and your attention.